Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. It is Thursday, June 23rd, 2016, and I'm Leanne McAdoo. Here's what's coming up tonight. Tonight, while the sit-ins of the 1960s were to gain rights, the sit-ins of Democrats now are to take rights away. Then, a tie in the Supreme Court blocks Obama's immigration policy. After that, should students be admitted or rejected based on their skin color? And the media fact checks Hillary's past and comes up with some rather hilarious excuses for her actions. That's next. Well, there are many important decisions being made at the Supreme Court today, the most important of which is Obama's immigration plan, which has been deadlocked, blocked by a four to four tie there at the Supreme Court. Now, this was President Obama's immigration plan that sought to shield millions who are already living in the U.S. illegally from deportation. It has effectively been killed for the rest of his presidency. Now, people who would have benefited from Obama's plan face no imminent threat of deportation because Congress has only provided money to deal with a small percentage of people who live in this country illegally. But his efforts to expand that protection to many other people is what has been blocked. Now, Obama responded saying that this takes us further from the country we aspire to be which if that's if the we he is talking about is the country he and Hillary Clinton are aspiring towards, that is just open borders and bringing in unvetted foreigners from regions that are infested with terrorism. Now, according to a Senate committee report coming out of the offices of Senator Jeff Sessions, there have been 580 terror convictions here in the U.S. since 9-11, and 380 of those terrorists have been foreign-born. So this means that they either got to the U.S. through illegal immigration or via a U.S. government-allowed legal immigration or a visa program or the refugee program. So the subcommittee had to conduct this research open source because they struggled with the Obama administration to, to find out where these people were actually from. And they found that of the 380 foreign-born, at least 24 were initially admitted to the U.S. as refugees. At least 33 overstayed their visas. Uh, they came from Pakistan, Lebanon, uh, some are Palestinian, Somalian, uh, Yemen, Iraq, Jordan, Egypt, and some from Afghanistan. Now, they talk a lot about how they had been fighting for more than 10 months to get this information from the Obama administration, and they passed it along to the DOJ to provide the information to the subcommittee on where these terrorist convictions, where they were actually from. They were trying to hide this information, of course, because this could be used against Hillary Clinton as well as President Obama while they're trying to get this passed. And so Jeff Sessions actually wrote uh, just last week directly to the president, pressing him on this very issue. And he says, when compared with your administration's immigration policies and bearing in mind the four major terrorist attacks in the U.S. in the last year alone, this inability to properly screen individuals from abroad and assimilate those we admit paints a striking picture. And given that we've already identified at least 40 individuals who were initially admitted to this country as refugees and were subsequently convicted or implicated in terrorism, including an Iraqi refugee who was just admitted to the U.S. in 2012 and arrested in January of this year, it is clear that ensuring the proper screening of refugees is of the utmost importance. Indeed. But, you know, I think that we're all just going to continue to be called crazy conspiracy theorists until people finally get a clue. Another big decision uh, that went today in the Supreme Court, they upheld a University of Texas affirmative action admissions. So they said that the University of Texas may consider the race of a student of student applicants in a limited way to build a diverse student body. Now, this was a four to three decision, and it was a surprising win for advocates of affirmative action who say the benefits of diversity at the nation's colleges and universities are worth the intrusion on the Constitution's guarantee of equal protection that generally forbids the government from making decisions based on racial classifications. So that's why this was very surprising that the Supreme Court upheld this decision for affirmative action decades ago. I can see where this was a very important thing. But now it is absolutely unfair. It's not in line with the constitutional promise of equal treatment. And the girl that actually brought this case forward 
They're making fun of her on Twitter, calling her uh, Becky with the bad grades. But it's not about having bad grades. You can be a spectacular student, have stellar grades. And if you're white, you might not get in due to affirmative action. And this is also interesting considering that the population of non-whites is continuing to grow. And here in Austin, Texas, where the university is, uh, less than half of the population here is actually white. And uh, according to the National Center for Education Statistics, black women have recently emerged as the most educated population of people by race and gender in the United States. So this means that they are a very powerful force in not only the political realm, but also in the business world. So no, that does not mean that minorities are taking over the United States, as some people out there are going to probably say in the comments. This just means it is time to rethink the victim status and maybe rethink this whole affirmative action thing. And another great decision that came down, the high courts are going to limit drunk driving test laws. So this was uh, the Supreme Court placed new limits on state laws that make it a crime for motorists suspected of drunken driving to refuse alcohol tests. So the justices ruled that police must obtain a search warrant before requiring drivers to take blood alcohol tests, but not breath tests, which the court considers less intrusive. And writing for the majority, uh, Justice Alito said that breath tests do not implicate significant privacy concerns, unlike blood tests. Breathing into a breathalyzer doesn't pierce the skin or leave a biological sample in the government's possession. So that's going to be very great because here, I know in many other states, but definitely here in Texas, uh, there is a no refusal and they'll just draw your blood right on the spot. So this might be able to change that. People can say it is a violation of their civil rights. Now, on Monday, four NYPD officials were arrested in a cops on call corruption probe. So these were four NYPD officials. They were arrested for accepting trips, lavish gifts and prostitutes from two Brooklyn businesses in exchange for police escorts, access and gun licenses. And that's very interesting because gun licenses are extremely hard to get in New York. And as Jakari Jackson always points out, Gun regulations are just going to create a black market for that product. And as we can see here, it's actually the police who are now in getting involved and in opening up these speakeasies for uh, passing their friends along so they can have gun licenses, basically creating a police force for themselves and their friends. Now, a New York Democratic rep, Charlie Rangel, was actually asked about this and about the gun permitting bribery scandal. And he actually said you know, members of Congress deserve and need people with firearms protecting them, but not the law abiding citizens. Take a listen. Well, I should say the uh, uber wealthy who, who have protection, had that protection, but individuals who are law abiding citizens in your district should not. Let's talk about that. Well, law abiding citizens just shouldn't have to carry a gun. You know that. So you're not going to push me in that direction. But you're protected by guns all over the place here in the Capitol. <laughs> Well, that's a little different. I think we deserve, I think we need to be protected down here. See, you do not deserve or need to be able to protect yourself and your family, only the very important people who we put in office. Now, Rangel was one of the people who were on the House floor yesterday. He was actually periscoping this sit-in spectacle, and they call it a spectacle. Um, Representative Mark Walker, who was there, tweeted out that it was actually a disgrace to Woolworths to call this a sit-in because those people back then were asking for rights while the House Democrats are protesting to have people's rights taken away. And so now, obviously, they're using their new social justice warrior tactics, saying, are they going to shut us down because they turned off the cameras? So then they start live streaming this, just trying to get as much attention as they can. And uh, Washington Free Weekend's editor in chief pointed out that the sit in isn't going to matter much because the Democrats have been very quick to reframe the gun control fights as anti terror fights. And that's been going on since the Orlando attack. And things got very heated on the floor there yesterday. Uh, Rep. Louis Gohmert was actually taking them to task on that, saying this, all the things that they're asking for would not have stopped the Orlando terror attack. Take a listen.
And as you can see, a lot of people were very passionate about this. This is radical Islamic extremism, and that is the real thing that we need to be dealing with in this country. Now, Gomer went on to say that they are using the instruments that helped gain civil rights to try to take away civil rights. He said, I'm telling you, this was incredible to see real American folk heroes like John Lewis, who was brutalized and stood up for civil rights. Folks were there using the instruments that help gain civil rights to try, try to take away our civil rights. Now, we pointed this out yesterday. John Lewis was uh, actually on a secret government list there with LBJ during the civil rights. So he knows what it's like to be on a secret government list and some go government agency can just arbitrarily put you on it. But he was also on the no-fly list. He had been stopped some 30, 45 times, asked about this, and he had to deal with this for more than a year to try to get taken off that list. But that's not all. He was actually also someone who signed a letter to the Department of Homeland Security in 2014 expressing some concern over this program. They say watch lists are an important tool to guard against terrorism, but they must strike the right balance with the U.S. civil rights and liberties. And they were concerned that the program that, they, that was put in place to give people steps to redress being put on this list, they were concerned that it provides no effective means of redress or unfair or incorrect designations. So they know that this is something that can just, people can get put on this list arbitrarily, and it's very difficult to get yourself off of this list. Paul Ryan came out and said that this Democratic stunt is not a proud moment for democracy. He said this isn't very proud for de democracy or for the people who staged these stunts. He said, this is the people's house. This is Congress, the House of Representatives, the oldest democracy in the world, and they're descending it into chaos. Why do I call this a stunt? Well, because it is one. There was a vote. It was in the committee through regular order and the vote failed. And that's something that they're not wanting to talk about. That's a fact. There was a vote and it failed. He said, if Democrats want to vote for a bill on the floor, there's a way to get one. It just takes 218 signatures on a petition and they can have a vote. It's that simple. Uh, but what they're doing, that's not it. And they're actually trying to get this done through a different order, staging protests, trying to get it on TV. And if it's not a political stunt, then why are they trying to raise money off of it? Because they had already prepared all of these mass emails to go out to all of their supporters to say, look at this, we've got to stop these Republicans. They're tweeting it out, blasting out these emails. So they were all prepared to pull this political stunt, which absolutely wasn't going to be effective at all. And he went on to say that our focus needs to be on confronting radical extremism. Terrorism is the issue. Let me say it again. Terrorism is the issue and defeating terrorism is our focus here in the House. So this is the people's house. So Jakari Jackson took to the streets of Austin, Texas to find out what the people thought of this stunt. As we speak, there's a sit in on Capitol Hill where the participants hope that their actions will draw attention to the four gun bills that recently failed in the Senate. Now, what's interesting about these four is that they all contain language about background checks in some measure or another. And it's leading many people to question, well, even if these bills have been retroactive, would they have prevented San Bernardino or more recently Orlando? Also, people are pointing out that one of the participants in the sit-in is John Lewis, a representative who has found himself a victim of the no-fly list. So we're going to talk to the people here today and see if the sit-in is the right way to go. Do you think it's good for the civilian populace at large to have the right to bear arms? Yes. Okay. Yes. And with the Democratic sit-ins, uh, one of the things they're trying to bring attention to is the bills that failed this week. They're basically all gun uh, gun background check bills. Do you think that gun background check bills, had they been retroactive, would have prevented Orlando, San Bernardino, or any number of the other shootings that we've seen here recently? I think they could. Mm -hmm. We could go farther into background checks before those type of guns are sold. Say of any of the bills that were up for vote that failed, would any of those prevented San Bernardino or Orlando, even if they had been retroactively passed? You know, if I was marketing it, I would be saying, like, it's, it's not about prevention, but it's lies. Hey, you know what? Maybe the guy couldn't have gone in Arsenal. Maybe he still could have gone guns. Maybe instead of four in Orlando, he would have killed 48 or 47 or 45. But at least there would have been that many more lives not killed. So if he couldn't do that gun, and if he could do another type of gun instead, does he still going to feel that his Second Amendment rights are in? Maybe they're infringed upon, but he still has Second Amendment rights. Well, they're it shall not be infringed. It's right there in the Constitution. Shall not be infringed. He has a, a semi-automatic gun. It's on freedom of speech, too. I mean, you know, we can only take it. It's not just carte blanche, excuse me, mm -hmm. not just carte blanche. Same things with guns. You know, all of our amendments have certain 
uh, limitations to immunity? I think, I think it's a very dated law. I don't think you should, especially to automatic weaponries that are totally designed to kill humans. Like, I don't think anyone should have access to that. I think guns should be absolutely controlled. In what way? Much more than they are now. Um, I think background checks should be improved. Um, I honestly don't think there's a necessity for guns. Other than for sport, I don't think um, they should be used for self-protection. You, you don't think they should be used for self-protection? I mean, I see people that have guns and they use them to, like, kill people. I think if everybody had a gun in return to defend themselves, people would just go crazy. I mean, there's already cops shooting people who are unarmed. Well, I personally think that there should be some gun control, but I also think that I have the right to bear arms to protect myself. That's how I feel. Um, I'm just not convinced that gun control would solve the problems because, I mean, if you take away guns from people, then they're going to find other ways to kill people, and obviously guns allow murder to a larger degree. But I think that freedom is one thing that is good for America, and you have to deal with the repercussions of that sometimes. Uh, tell, us, tell us your view on the uh, AK-47, the AR-15. It's a glorified 22 with a little bit more velocity. Big deal. I think all people that think black guns are scary are racist. Oh, wow. So you're saying that it's triggering the people. That's right. The lone wolf narrative of the Orlando attack is being questioned once again. Now new evidence has surfaced that there were multiple participants in the Orlando shooting. Now on Wednesday, Catherine Harridge told the Kelly file that audio captured on cell phones during the attack revealed that Mateen was conversing with one or more people about tactics and he was not talking to 911. Megan, an investigative source says a lot of people inside the club were using their phones to record what was going on, even inside the bathroom where Omar Mateen took hostages. The source said the FBI is doing a forensic review of the phones, and audio was captured of Mateen where he appears to be having a conversation about the attack, and he was not talking to 911. We don't know a lot more about what was said by Mateen, but the source said it was the kind of conversation you would have with someone who was familiar with what was going on. Now, IntelliHub actually reported on this back on June 15th, and it was mentioned during an ABC interview with one of the victims, but of course it was scrubbed, never really went into that much further because, you know, eyewitness accounts. But this person said during the interview, the eyewitness who played dead for several hours during the attack as a strategy to stay alive said that he had overheard a phone conversation that the shooter was engaged in. The eyewitness said that the shooter made mention that he was the fourth shooter and that there were three others, snipers, along with a female suicide bomber that was playing dead. So I could see how ABC might not want to run with what this witness said, but it'll be very interesting to find out just what was on those phones that were capturing the audio in that room. Now there are reports that another young man was arrested in Indiana. He's a teenager, and he was arrested for trying to join ISIS and commit acts of terrorism here on U.S. soil. Uh, this is Akram Musla, and he was arrested as he tried to board a Greyhound bus to New York from Indiana. FBI had been tracking him for months. He allegedly was planning to join ISIS abroad, and he has been accused of communicating with ISIS sympathizers about committing terror acts here on U.S. soil, potentially Florida and Indiana. So here again, we have these people who are, they're going to call them homegrown terrorists, but obviously their ideology is being imported here to the West. They're getting radicalized online, and then they're stupid enough to post about it, although, of course, the FBI and other agencies appreciate it because it makes them easier to track. But this is what is coming out of this Senate committee report out of Senator Jeff Sessions' office, where he's talking about the fact that since 9-11, there have been 580 terror convictions here in the U.S. 380 of those terrorists are foreign-born. So they are coming in from all sorts of countries where terrorism is rife, including Pakistan, Lebanon, uh, Palestine, Somalia, Yemen, Iraq, Jordan, uh, Egypt, Afghanistan. So they're coming in uh, either illegally or uh, via immigration, the U.S. government uh, uh, visa program or the refugee programs. Many of them have come in, at least 24 admitted as refugees. Uh, but this is what they're trying to conflate with the no-fly list. They're saying that this is the terror watch list. Of course, they shouldn't be able to purchase guns. But 
It's not the terror watch list. It's the no fly list that we're dealing with. The Democrats staged another disgraceful publicity stunt in an effort to push for more gun control legislation. This time they occupied the House floor in a sit-in that lasted just over 25 hours. Rise up, Democrats. Rise up, Americans. This cannot stand. We will occupy this floor. How ironic is it that during the civil rights era, back in the 1960s, these types of sit-ins took place as a method of asking for rights, but now modern day Democrats are protesting to have our rights taken away. Welcome to the new America. Don't be fooled by the grandstanding, ladies and gentlemen, because this is pure political theater. I mean, think about it. Where were the Democrats during the Fast and Furious scandal? Did they filibuster or stage a sit-in when it became blatantly obvious that the Obama administration let thousands of automatic weapons fall into the hands of the Mexican drug cartels? Of course not. Now, when were you first told or became knowledgeable about U.S. officials allowing firearms to be sold to the drug cartels in Mexico. I don't know. When was anyone in the White House first informed about the tactics that were used under Operation Fast and Furious? I, I don't know. And did they hold filibusters and press conferences when the Obama administration shipped U.S. military weapons to ISIS to overthrow Syrian President Bashir al-Assad? I didn't see a filibuster, did you? Because they don't want to talk about that. Just like they don't want to talk about a sitting president who is more interested in disarming Americans than he is in stopping the tsunami of radical Muslim refugees entering our country right now. And we're talking about extremists who want us dead. Meanwhile, the mainstream media's talking point this week has been the terrorist watch list, because after all, we can all agree that terrorists should not have the ability to purchase firearms. Uh, people who are on the terrorist watch list here in the U.S., who knew that they were still legally able to buy guns? There are 700,000 people on the U.S. terror watch list. Stuart, right. what the heck is up with this? People who are on the terrorist watch list, they can't fly, but they can go and buy guns and have been successful at doing so? I think if somebody has been watch listed, even if they're ultimately removed from the watch list, uh, and they go to purchase an assault weapon, that ought to be enough to trigger the FBI to taking another look. You, you have somebody that just makes common sense around keeping terrorists away from buying guns who are being investigated as being potential terrorists but you still have this due process issue and that's where the rub is whether you know you, you run up against um, particularly advocates of gun rights who think that the idea of the government keeping lists on Americans is uh, either an infringement in and of itself or a slippery slope the issue is not whether people buy guns the issue is watching the Republican Congress and the right and the right wing allow terrorist suspects to buy and collect firearms so are you so look, if you're on a terrorist watch list, you should be in jail. I don't think you should be on a list. You should be in jail. If, you, if you're suspected and convicted and actually criminalized of, of conducting terrorist attacks or, or terrorist tendencies, you should be in jail. So you shouldn't be on a list. But Carl, isn't that a violation of someone's civil rights? Throw them in jail rather than just depriving them of access to guns? Well, both are right. So, Allison, where do you draw the line? Here's the deal. If you are on a terrorist, if you're on a terror watch list, or if you're on a no-fly list, you are allowed because of the Republican Congress to buy and collect firearms. Well, here's the problem. Besides the end of due process, we've already seen what happens when you end up being put on one of these government watch lists. I mean, millions of people are put on these lists. Most of them are law-abiding, good American citizens. And I'll give you a good example. This guy was on a government watch list. Martin Luther King Jr., who was a Republican, by the way, he would not be able to purchase a firearm if he were alive today and the Democrats got their way. And of course, I'm not just picking on the Democrats. After all, it was George W. Bush. He was the guy who originally back in 2007, he was the president who wanted a no-fly list added to the no-buy list. 
So George W. wanted any American citizen who was on the TSA no-fly list kept from being able to purchase firearms. So it's not a necessarily a left versus right issue. And let me tell you something, if you dare go up against the system, you too might find yourself on the government terrorist watch list. And my question is, why would Drew Griffin's name come on the watch list post his investigation of TSA? What a curious and interesting and troubling phenomenon. What is the basis of this sudden recognition that Drew Griffin is a terrorist? Are we targeting people because of their critique or criticism? He may share the name with someone who's, who's, who was put on, and if he has a complaint about it, he ought to refer it over to the IG. Uh, the veto message of the president on House Joint Resolution 88. The clerk will report the title of the joint resolution. House Joint Resolution 88. Joint resolution to the chaos on the floor was downright embarrassing. Steve Watson writes, as Democrats occupied the House Wednesday and staged a sit-in to push for action on gun control legislation, critics lambasted them for their actions, with one GOP rep calling the action a disgrace. Calling this a sit-in is a disgrace to Woolworths, Representative Mark Walker tweeted, referring to the infamous civil rights protest sit-ins that took place in the 1960s. Walker noted that while those protesting back then were asking for rights, House Democrats are protesting to have rights taken away. The staged action began with Representative John Lewis giving a speech to the rest of the Democrats gathered. We cannot continue to stick our heads in the sand and ignore the reality of mass gun violence in our nation. Deadly mass shootings are becoming more and more frequent. Mr. Speaker, this is a fight. It is not an opinion. We must remove the blinders. The time for silence and patience is long gone. We are calling on the leadership of the House to bring common sense gun control legislation to the House floor. Give us a vote. The Democrats then all proceeded to sit down on the floor of the chamber. The lawmakers told reporters they would not move from the floor until House Republicans schedule a vote on gun control legislation. Cameras in the chamber were turned off, and the House was declared in recess, with Speaker Paul Ryan's entourage declaring that it would remain that way for as long as the Democrats choose to hold up the legislative process. The Washington Post reported that members began shouting, are they going to shut us down, before some even began video streaming on their phones, with the feeds even being broadcast by C-SPAN. While some Democrats accused Ryan of shutting off the cameras, the Post noted that it was done merely as a matter of procedure. The report also noted when the tables were turned eight years ago and Republicans were doing a sit-in, both the cameras and the lights were also off. You know, in Washington, we can overinterpret these theatrical events and everything and kind of endow them with great significance when in the long run, it probably won't matter much. I still believe in the Constitution and I believe in the uh, Second Amendment, but I'm for gun control. The, where the real killing's going on is our guns and our military going overseas and bombing and killing and starting wars that aren't necessary. Is it any wonder why the disapproval of Congress's hypocrisy has reached record highs consecutively throughout Obama's reign in office? Apparently, the socialist nightmare known as the Democratic Party felt it was high time to weigh in for their globalist overlords. Isn't it abundantly clear by now? The United Nations' desperation to disarm American citizens in order to reduce us into cannon fodder for the whims of the New World Order has never been more obvious. John Bound for Infowars.com well, if you don't watch InfoWars, you might not even know that an assassination attempt was made against Donald Trump. That's because it was barely mentioned. It was a blink and you'll miss it news story out there in all the mainstream media. Well, we have actually an NBC producer tweeting out that it could be argued that the dude who was hoping to assassinate Donald Trump is just a good guy with a gun. 
Are you kidding me? Can you imagine if this would have been a, a Trump supporter that had attempted to do this against Hillary Clinton? It would be everywhere. They're, they would be exploiting this story. It would still be going on in the news. CNN would probably do 24 hour news broadcast breaking this down. Uh, it's just like when they had the guy run on stage a few months back and the Secret Service actually had to stop him from attacking Donald Trump. Do you think that they said this guy's a crazy loon? Oh my gosh, this is terrible. No, they actually rolled the guy out and gave him a prime time slot on the news to tell everyone why he wanted to punch Donald Trump in the face. Totally ridiculous, completely biased, insane. So, of course, when Trump came out attacking Hillary Clinton this week, we have all of the media rallying around to prove that it was just a bunch of conspiracy theories. And of course, this is the uh, this is the narrative that Clinton herself is pushing out. She said he's responding with outlandish lies and conspiracy theories. He's a reckless candidate with reckless ideas who's trying to distract the American public. No, he's trying to tell the American public everything that the media fails to explain to them and does a very good job of circling the wagons to try to protect you continually. And in fact, we have a, a reporter coming out of Slate. So we have the media actually agreeing with some of the things that Donald Trump was saying, agreeing that Hillary is funded by anti-gay regimes. So this is Slate's Jeremy Stahl. He confirmed that the Clinton Foundation indeed is raking in millions of dollars from regimes uh, and anti-gay monarchs and other third world dictators. But he questioned whether it was a conflict of interest. He also failed to acknowledge the hypocrisy of Democratic candidates taking donations from countries that behead gays and stone women. But he goes on to say, you know, here at the Trump rally, it means more than that. It's a reason to throw Clinton behind bars. Now, I thought that was pretty funny because obviously he's seeing a lot of these Hillary for prison T-shirts that everyone is wearing at the Trump rallies. But that's not why people are calling for her imprisonment. They want to see her thrown in prison because of the presumptive violation of the Freedom of Information Act by setting up her own private homebrew server in the closet in her house, in her basement bathroom. Totally safe from foreign hackers, right? And of course, that's probably why her IT staffer has had to plead the fifth 125 consecutive times because he doesn't want to incriminate himself. And then there's an article coming out of the Daily Mail, how Clinton's server was wide open to hackers for weeks. And Huma Abedin actually was warning other officials not to use her secret address. These are new emails. They're revealing uh, how her server had a technical problem so serious that its security systems were shut off. And then Huma Abedin emailed people, high ranking staff, warning them, don't email HRC anything sensitive. I can explain more in person. So, you know, and obviously we've learned that later hackers did indeed get into that homebrew server. The Clinton camp still denies that it happened. And then, of course, we've got CNN's fact checkers coming out. Uh, this is Christina Alessi and Lori Frankel. They were fact checking something coming out of the Clinton cash uh, with Hillary Clinton's State Department approving the transfer of 20 percent of U.S. uranium to the Russian government as nine investors in the deal funneled one hundred and forty five million dollars to the Clinton Foundation. And they were like, well, you know, we just couldn't find any evidence that there was some quid pro quo, quid pro quo. And so we're going to just we're going to claim that it's false. Well, well, the New York Times had a 4,000 word front page story written about a year ago. It was a Pulitzer Prize winning jur investigative journalist who wrote it. And they had stunning detail, including charts and graphs laying out the flow of millions of dollars from the nine investors in the uranium deal who flowed one hundred and forty five million dollars to Hillary's family foundation. But you know what? It's false because the fact checkers at CNN said it was. And then, of course, we have the Chinese government who paid Bill Clinton massive speaking fees just 10 days before Hillary made her famous Asia pivot. So, you know, half a million dollars in quote unquote speaking fees must have been some pretty awesome speeches out of uh, Bill Clinton there. And then we also have her top Clinton aides actually mocking the fact that there was a donor appointed to a board who had absolutely no experience. So just give Hillary a little bit of money and you'll get a cushy job there.
Joe Biggs here with Infowars.com. Now, yesterday, Donald Trump gave a speech really hammering a lot of the things that we already know about Hillary Clinton. He came out in a huge assault on the things that she's been involved in, from Benghazi to the email scandals to her slogan being, I'm with her, and Donald Trump coming back and saying, no, I'm with you, the American people. So what we're going to do is we're going to walk around, we're going to talk to people and ask them what they think about Donald Trump's speech yesterday on Hillary Clinton. Trump came out yesterday and said that she was a world-class liar because she was involved in email scandal, Benghazi, and uh, she lied about coming under sniper fire in Bosnia. What, what are your thoughts about that statement? I think that Trump University speaks for everything. He's a failure at a lot of things, and he likes to point out people's weaknesses. He's a bully. He's who our parents taught us to not be when we were younger. Yeah, I can't stand the guy. Um, the scandals he spoke of, um, most of which uh, I feel have been brought up before. Uh, is Hillary the perfect candidate? Uh, I don't think so. Um, however, when looking at the person who's slinging the accusations, uh, I can't help but question whether or not it's the pot calling the kettle black. Well, I mean, I'm kind of with him on the whole lying aspect. I mean, since she's since I've heard about Hillary from just being, you know, into politics at all, it's just been constant shit that hasn't added up. But with Trump, I mean, he's uneducated himself, so I don't think he really has any room to talk about other than business nah. for the company. That's exactly right. He doesn't. He's equally, if not more, of a liar than she is. Like, Just you can't... He's uneducated. I wouldn't say he's lying. I'd say he doesn't know what he's talking there about. Okay, that's probably better. Aside from the details, which are, which are difficult to, to sort through, I think that the reality is that when you, when you can have a conversation like that about somebody, and there is even the remote possibility that it could be true, then that indicates that there's a real problem, right? I mean, you have to go through a lot of stuff to figure out whether all that, what the various details are, but, but she's not above reproach on any of those accusations, and that by itself is problematic. So what do you think about Hillary Clinton? I don't really think anything. I don't think I want to, I'm sorry. <laughs> I wouldn't want to talk about her either. She's evil. What are your thoughts on Hillary? On Hillary, I'm a Hillary supporter. Yeah? Yeah. And why is that? Well, I uh, uh, hadn't thought about this. Uh, give me a second here. What do you think about Hillary Clinton? She's all right. So what's all right about her? Um, I don't see anything terrible about her. I'm voting for her. Yeah? Yep. What do you think about Hillary Clinton? Um, from the information I have, I wouldn't want her as president. No? Yesterday, Trump said Hillary ran the State Department like her own personal hedge fund, doing favors for oppressive regimes for cash. What do you think about that statement? Um, I don't know. I mean, I think there's, you know, there's definitely a culture of sort of uh, uh, taking in, you know, money from powerful interests, whether they be Wall Street interests, whether they be, you know, foreign governments or... Uh, people or entities connected with foreign governments. I don't, I don't know whether she's actually engaged in any kind of quid pro quo. Um, I, I haven't studied it closely enough and there's conflicting, you know, statements about that. And, and um, so I, I don't draw a hard conclusion like Trump does, but I, I, I think there are definitely questions about Hillary. Yeah. Trump said that Hillary Clinton ran the State Department like her own personal hedge fund doing favors for oppressive regimes for cash. No, I don't buy that. Now, she comes out and she says she's a feminist, she's pro-woman, but she takes money from Saudi Arabia who make women cover themselves, they chop their heads off in the streets, uh, kill homosexuals, yeah. things like that. Yeah, it's absolutely absurd. I, I mean, like, they're both the absolute worst possible. The, I mean, can, can think about what Canada is saying about our election right now. They're laughing at us. Everybody is laughing at us right now because it's a freaking joke. Well, what do you think about Hillary Clinton? Uh, I'm voting for her, so that's... What? Really? Yeah, yeah. Why? Uh, well... You know, I see, I, I honestly don't have time for this, but good, good luck to you, you know. Because of my t-shirt? Well, for prison, it's pretty, uh, it's a pretty aggressive stance, especially considering Trump's also being investigated for fraud for Trump U, so. Yeah, but one's FBI. Well, lesser of two evils, in my opinion. Well, that's it for the show tonight. Thank you for tuning in, and we will see you here again tomorrow at 7 p.m. Central.